For Session Update, I'm Shannon Lurkey. A bipartisan group of lawmakers spoke to the media about a bill to legalize recreational marijuana use, agreeing that it is time to at least begin a comprehensive discussion in light of the number of other states who've made the move. Here's that media event. And today we introduce House File 420 or Senate File 619, a bipartisan bill that will legalize recreational cannabis for adults at least 21 years old. This legislation will further decriminalize and regulate cannabis use in Minnesota. The bill will primarily focus on the regulatory framework to provide for responsible oversight of recreational use of cannabis and will address the revenue collection only as secondary. That is why the rate uh, for tax rate is intentionally left blank. As you may recall, before medical cannabis became law, the state lawmakers of members of the public participated in a month-long conversation about the merits of legalization of medical cannabis. While emotions ran high, a bipartisan consensus created a carefully regulated system with safeguards to prevent abuse. As more states legalize cannabis for recreational use, most recently our Midwest neighbor Michigan, by ballot initiative, Minnesota has thus far been reluctant to engage in the kind of serious conversation that happened five years ago. Many have asked me why I'm carrying this bill, and I answer because it makes sense and the time has come to have this important conversation. Rarely as a state legislature do you have the ability to have a win-win scenario. To tax a product that consumers agree should be taxed and regulated. By doing so, we are making it safer by removing the need for the black market to exist while eliminating the harm it has done to society. In addition, the state has both a public health and a safety interest in regulating and educating Minnesotans on the effects of the use of cannabis to provide the necessary oversight and legal framework moving forward. As an attorney and a mother of two young boys, I will tackle this issue with an open mind. I am not working on this to appease any interest group. We are all welcome to participate and input is needed from everyone. My intent is that we responsibly, responsibly regulate all aspects of cannabis use by first prohibiting the use of sale to minors under 21 years, keep current law prohibiting impaired driving, that is existing law, uphold the Clean Indoor Air Act, protect employer rights to keep the workplace safe, protect landlord rights to prevent smoking on their property, keep local control to regulate the production and sale in local communities, establish rules on the operation of dispensaries, and develop a tracking system seed to sale. We also will distribute revenue to mental health services, training for police, and public health education for teens about the potential health consequences of cannabis use. We allow for expungement of cannabis crimes from records previously convicted persons and we dedicate funding to communities disproportionately affected by the prohibition. We know the time has come to have this debate. Even Governor Tim Walz indicated that he would sign a recreational cannabis bill into law should it reach his desk. Public op opinion polling conducted prior to the midterm elections also found that 56% of Minnesotans favor legalization. In sum, our bill will do the following attempt to eliminate the black market sales of cannabis, study the effects of cannabis related to potency levels and dosage for safe driving, warn the public about consumption if you have risk factors for addiction, restrict access to youth, and decriminalize the expunge past, and expunge past violent offenses. It would also fund studies by the scientific community that are peer reviewed on mental health impacts and risk factors. With that, I will pass it on to my uh, chief author in the House, uh, Senator Mike Freiberg. Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Senator Franson, for your leadership on this issue. Um, I'm Mike Freiberg. I'm, I'm a state representative uh, from District 45B, chair of the Government Operations Committee. Um, Senator Franson provided a, a great summary of the bill, so I won't reiterate that. Um, I do want to say, however, that the issue of cannabis legalization is one that's moving incredibly fast around the country. Um, more and more states um, have at least a, a, 
a vast majority of states have at least a medical cannabis program in place, and many have moved to recreational cannabis as well. At a certain point, it will become inevitable here in Minnesota. Um, and so we have, some op we have two options in front of us. One is to attempt to get in front of this issue um, and put strong public health protections in place. Um, and the other is to wait for it to come to us. So um, we've taken a position that, that we need to get in front of this. Um, we need to make sure that cannabis doesn't become another big tobacco, where it's a product that's targeted towards kids uh, through attractive flavors, through attractive marketing campaigns. Um, we need to put strong public health protections in place, make sure there's a minimum age of 21. Um, so this bill, I think, will go a long way to doing that. Um, thank you, Senator Jensen, for being here as well. Um, there's bipartisan support for this bill. Um, it's going to be a long discussion. It will not be an easy one, but we are all up for the challenge. Um, the bill will probably go through many changes as, as it moves forward, but I think we have a really strong um, foundation in place here to start this discussion in the Minnesota legislature, and I'm hopeful that we can do it this year. So thank you for being here and for your interest. Senator Greetings, Scott Jensen, Carver County Senate District. Thank you for coming. Three months ago, I could not have envisioned myself standing at a podium uh, speaking on a marijuana issue. But uh, I've had numerous constituents ask me to get involved. They've said, Doc, with your scientific background, your awareness of what's going on in the field, you need to do this. You need to be on the side of this is, that's moving this discussion forward. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about that over the last three months and doing a lot of reading. The legislative library here has a, uh, multiple materials. Uh, they've got a 75-page report from the state of New York, as New York considered what they would do in this regard. Uh, there's another lengthy report in regards to the health aspects of it. So I'm here in part because I think the ship has sailed. And I want to tell you why I think that ship has sailed. Things happen incrementally from a legislative perspective, and certainly that was the case with medical marijuana. If you look at the medical marijuana report for Minnesota, there's more than 20 diagnostic criteria that are eligible diagnoses. I did a little poll over the last two weeks of all the patients I saw in my office that were over the age of 50. Three-fourths of them qualify for medical marijuana if they wanted it in terms of a diagnosis. What are the most recent four diagnoses that have allowed eligible eligibility, if you will, for medical marijuana? Dementia, obstructive sleep apnea. Now, I don't think I've ever seen anybody go in for an evaluation of obstructive sleep apnea that didn't come out with a CPAP machine, even if 75% of those machines are collecting dust within 12 months. But nevertheless, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common diagnosis. PTSD. The autism spectrum. And for some patients with autism, medical marijuana has been nothing short of a miracle. But other diagnoses that have been sitting in the law for quite a while include glaucoma, refractory muscle spasms, and a variety of neurologic and musculoskeletal issues. So frankly, if a person really wants medical marijuana, they can probably get it. A few weeks ago, I released as a news report the fact that hemp is no longer an illegal product. And one of the first hemp agricultural initiatives is taking place in my district in Carver County, a little to the west of Oconia. Hemp is a product that's used oftentimes in fabrics and textiles, and it comes from the same cannabis plant. When George Washington was alive, you could be found guilty of a crime if you weren't farming at least some of your land for hemp. Everybody had to have hemp as an agricultural product for a while in our country's history. So there are a variety of cannabinoids out there. The two big ones are THC and CBD. CBD is uh, a tough word to pronounce, uh, but it's cannabidiol. And the THC is the tetrahydrocannabinol. Those are the two. The CBD is already legal. It's used in a variety of natural <coughs> remedies. And the fact of the matter is it has very little psychoactive THC in it. What we're talking about now is we're talking about legalizing marijuana and THC. We cannot afford to get behind this. We have to be in front of this. We have to have the discussion. If we get behind, we're going to have kids using it. We're going to have marketing going on that's going to absolutely lure them in. So a responsible age of 21, addressing things like gateway considerations, addressing impaired safety on the roads, public safety issues, those are critical issues now. So we have to have the discussion. 
two political groups were able to achieve major political status in our last election. That sends a clear signal to all of us at the legislature. This is not something that can be blocked by committee chairs saying we're not going to hear it. This bill, this idea has to be shown in the light of day and we all have to be there participating. Thank you. So now we'll open it up for any questions. I have a question for Senator Jensen, but you guys are welcome to respond if you feel. Um, and I want to ask you just because of the work you've done on the op opioid epidemic and the bill last session and presumably this session, some of the sponsors of that legislation feel that there is a mixed message being sent if you're uh, going after opioids and trying to resolve that to also then be giving some sort of a state imprimatur to marijuana. Can you tell me what your thinking is on that and whether that troubles you at all? I think that's a great question. The question is, does a conversation regarding the legalization of marijuana conflict with trying to address an epidemic and critical opioid epidemic? I would say the opposite. There is no question that in my own experience, both as a private practitioner and someone who teaches residents and has been a professor at the medical school for 30 years, I have many patients that have been able to get off of the opiates by using medical marijuana and other analgesics as well. My district is pretty conservative, and I suspect I'll get some feedback. But I had a town hall meeting on Saturday morning, and we had 150 people attend, and we had standing room only. And I asked the group there, I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to do one quick polling question. I said, I think it's time that we have that robust discussion regarding the legalization of marijuana. What are the issues? What are the facts? What is the fake news? More than 90% of the people at my town hall meeting raised their hand that it's time to have that discussion. But getting to the specific issue of opiates and THC, fears in that regard should not stop us from having the discussion. We need to dig in. We need to look at how do we deal with impaired driving, gateway concerns, and public safety. Senator, um, I remember you telling uh, me and a couple others just off to the side in this very room a couple of weeks ago that you would like to see a study done on this issue first. So has this been a pretty recent evolution for you on this issue? When Senator Franzen asked me to participate in this, she said that one of her big goals was to provide traction to that robust discussion. I think that Senator Franzen and I would agree, but I would certainly ask her to speak for herself, that whatever study we can do as this issue moves incrementally forward would be a good thing. Whether or not an additional formal new study needs to be done or simply gleaning the information available from present studies would be adequate probably is, remains to be seen. There is a very good study on the kinetics and the bioavailability and the metabolism and the degradation of THC in persons out of Canada, and I'd be glad to get forward that to you. But I thought it was one of the most elegant pieces in terms of how can we get our arms around making certain that people using marijuana aren't providing us a level of impaired driving that we just don't want to encounter. Given your comment earlier, how hard is this going to be to get a herd in committee? Is, are you anticipating some road, roadblocks ahead? I have learned that everything is hard if it's controversial, because nobody wants to vote on it at the next election. So I suspect that all three of us up here are going to have to negotiate, give a little, and do a little horse trading out there for a constitutional amendment. How does this fit in with that? Is this sort of a companion piece, or, or are you all supportive of that, potentially? Uh, this, this bill is not a constitutional amendment. This is uh, just legislative authorization for recreational cannabis use. Um, any constitutional amendment, before it gets put to the voters, has to get approved. Um, by the legislative, by both chambers of the legislature first. So in my mind, I can't speak for everyone up here, but at least in my mind, um, you know, if we're already going to be having that discussion to get it on the ballot, I think we should just go forward and, and legalize it. I, you know, this is, I think after the 2012 election where there were two constitutional amendments on the ballot, I think some voters have, um, have constitutional amendment fatigue, frankly. Um, I think we can do this ourselves. I'm not convinced 
uh, that the issue of cannabis belongs in the Constitution. Constitutions, whether they're at the state or the federal level, are typically for protecting civil rights of people and for setting up government and the limitations of government. Um, I'm not sure this, is, this fits into those categories. Um, I'm open to having the discussion with people, and if that's the direction the legislature wants to move eventually, I wouldn't necessarily say no, but at least at this point, that, that's I don't, I don't really want to start with a constitutional amendment. Senator Jensen, you, you talked about horse trading, and we all know that that's part of it here. How, how do you do horse trading on this bill? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's either legalized or not legalized, or do something like a study, or, I mean, isn't it? Or, or where is the area for compromise here to move this thing forward? I think the question that I was addressing had to do with what would be the challenge in terms of getting committee hearings? And I think that's the horse trading I was referring to. Oftentimes, if someone wants my support or my vote on a given issue, I might say, well, I have mixed feelings about that. You know, I'm, I might be willing to sign on to provide traction and some bipartisan support for this issue to be discussed. But if you really want my signature, I need to have this bill heard. And that may seem sort of raw and crass, but that's what I've learned over the last 24 months, is that the process here oftentimes is raw. And it's not always Mr. Nice Guy. It's you got to negotiate. And if someone wants something from you that you're a little uncomfortable with, then you have to say, well, make it worth my while. Well, let's say that you, you do get a hearing on it. Um, how do you ultimately get support? The majority leader says, we're going to do something on opioids. You know, there's a lot of pressure for that. We need to do something on opioids in terms of the opioid epidemic. But then he says, on the other hand, we're going to legalize marijuana for recreational use. How do you get around? I mean, there's a significant number of folks in your caucus who are going to follow what the majority leader says. You know that as well as I do. I do. I would give a shout out to former Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback in his column yesterday in the newspaper where he said simply because we legalize something doesn't mean it's good for you. He said legalization has to be partnered with prevention. And I really believe that. And I think this is why Senator Franzen wants to get this out in front of people so that as we talk about the legalization process and the regulation process so that I can maybe quit seeing kids come in on a Monday or Tuesday or maybe adults that ran into some quote bad stuff that isn't regulated because of the production. Not to mention the fact that by doing what we're doing right now is artificially propping up the price by threefold. I have patients that have autism that are spending thousands of dollars a year to control their autism and allow themselves to be redirected. And the fact of the matter is, if this were legalized, we'd see the, pri the price drop by to a third of what it is now, and we would also see a, a regulatory process. But I, I think that this is going to be an incremental process, and, and we're going to move forward. But I think we absolutely want to make sure we send a strong message to Minnesotans that legalization doesn't mean it's good for you. We've got tobacco and alcohol, and that's not necessarily good for you either. So we have to partner legalization with prevention and making certain that we're in front of this instead of behind it. It sounds like what you're saying, Senator, is that you don't believe that marijuana is good for you. Is that correct? If you came to my office and said, as a part of your physical, Doc, is tobacco good for me? Because it's legal. I would say, no, it's not good for you. And then you'd say, Doc, is alcohol good for me? Because it's legal. And I'd say, no, it's not good for you. If someone comes to you and says, Doc, is recreational marijuana good for me? I would say, no. There's no study that says it's good for you. If there's a medical condition we're treating, it may well provide enhanced health. But in terms of using it recreationally, I'm not going to stand before a group of people and say that's good for you. But I'm going to say that if it's legal, there can be a lot of benefits that come from that. And the benefits being that you regulate it, you don't have sources that are, that are unknown. Is that what you're talking about? I think the benefits are a, a, a more purified, regulated product is one. I think that you will allow a greater use medically because right now patients, well, I don't prescribe medical marijuana. I've elected it to not. But I know that many of my patients could benefit from it. So I do refer my patients for medical marijuana to colleagues of mine that have chosen to gain some expertise in this area. I just have not chosen to do that. But I think if it's legalized, I think you're going to see a lot of people, instead of going on Alprazolam or Xanax uh, for some of the stressful things in their life, perhaps flying across the ocean, they may well use a small amount of THC. And there's no question in those situations we can, get we can step away from some of these addictive agents and go to something that is probably far safer and people will learn 
through this process, how it's metabolized, how long it stays in the system, and what the untoward effects are, as well as what contraindications we have in terms of interacting with other medications that people are already on. The, the bill, it's, it's labeled recreational. Therefore, you know, if, if it's legal, anybody who wants to do it for just for the fun of it, so therefore, aren't you opening that up a lot more? I mean, exclusive of the of the possible me folks who who need some sort of a some sort of a drug for for emotional reasons, and they're going to go to marijuana instead of an opioid or something like that. I understand that, but 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 aren't you going to have just a lot of other people who are just going to say, yeah, I'm, I mean, I know people who just you know get marijuana just because they they like to do it. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are that way. So so. Why are we not expanding that then? That's going to be the argument against us. Absolutely. I'll turn it over to Senator Preston. So that's a great question. And, and just because something's legal, as uh, Senator Jensen has alluded to, doesn't make it that it's perfectly safe, right? There's opioids aren't perfectly safe, and they're legal to prescribe. Uh, what we're saying is uh, we're going to take time, even if you take time to look at the bill, um, which just got um, published today, we take time for a regulatory uh, rulemaking process with the Department of Health and other stakeholders to make sure that the, we adopt the right rules to make sure it's as safe as we can do for labeling of, of the product, for edibles, for every single aspect that we can think of. Uh, certainly, we, we have to have those by 2021 under this bill, which gives us time, and it won't be allowed to be um, sell, sold in stores until 2022. So we're not in a hurry to have this debate. We're in a hurry to have a, a, a civil debate on the pros and cons, and if Minnesota is going to go in this way, uh, that we have the best framework of any other state. Well, let me Senator, ask Senator, Senator, how important is the uh, <coughs> expungement part of this bill? It, it, and does the legalization and the decriminalization have to be done hand in hand, or could they be done separately? That's, that's another great question. I, th I think they do go hand in hand because uh, the people who have been uh, hurt by the prohibition are the same people that we're trying to um, restore in terms of restorative justice and uh, racial justice that this bill um, considers. So I, I, what we try to do is have all the buckets of areas that we thought this issue would touch on, which is frankly every single committee of, of our legislature, uh, from schools, public health, public safety, um, health care, everything, and, and try to have a comprehensive, holistic approach of what this would look like and not take it piecemeal. Um, was was the grow your own uh, factor in this bill, and and why do you need something like that? Well, that's another of the issues that comes up. Are we going to allow for uh, people to be able to grow their own? And in our bill, we start very conservatively uh, at four uh, plants, and because we're thinking, you know, what's the minimum that we can have that it actually would work? What if we over plant over um, uh, water plant? I have no idea. This is not my area of expertise, but we try to be very low, but to make sure that we have a, a placeholder of that discussion. And certainly that comes with licensing. It comes with regulation. It comes with education. It's not that we're going to let everybody do this, and you have to be over 21, and it's not going to be um, to have a greenhouse in every uh, home in Minnesota. That's not what we're talking about. What about employment, though, for employers who currently screen for THC and then don't offer employment, if it's illegal, then can employers still not hire, unless it's for driving or something like that that would be regulated? In terms of employment in the workplace, we make sure that it's still, I mean, right now people are smoking, uh, people are doing this, and, and, and employers are, are tackling this issue. We're actually going to look at it closer and try to find ways that employers have better tools to figure out who's impaired and what they need to do. Um, we're not going to uh, loosen um, regulations for the employers. There's certainly uh, an argument that we need employment safety and, and people with um, that operate heavy machinery. We're not changing that. We're not changing um, that you can um, now smoke while you're driving. Actually, we explicitly have that as a uh, misdemeanor offense if you do that because it currently isn't tackled in state law. We also um, uphold state law that you can't have more than an ounce of uh, cannabis uh, in your possession. So with criminal penalties, if you go above, we're just making it, um, like I mentioned, decriminalizing in terms of uh, making it um, work for people who can hold it legally and, and, and still make sure that our roads and our, our workplaces are, are safe. And when would it be available for sale under your bill? You mentioned that. 2022, January 1st of 2022. And all these um, dates are, are pretty arbitrary, but we recognize that we don't, if we had a constitutional amendment in 2020, uh, we can uh, potentially have it, you know, effective right away. So we need to, the time to take um, the necessary rulemaking procedures and make sure, making sure that we're ready for it and it's not uh, the wild, wild west like, as it is right now. 
Just one part on the radio yesterday said that there's no field sobriety test um, for marijuana that's equivalent to, to alcohol. Is, is that true or well, you know? Um, as for that, we, yep, yeah, sure. If you actually look at the data in regards to measuring impaired driving, Certainly field sobriety tests are going to be a big part of it, but we're getting closer and closer. We have salivary or tests on saliva that will give us whether you're at five nanograms per cc or two nanograms or if you're going to go with just a, uh, any present at all. It, 25 to 28 days is typically what it takes for THC to leave your system, and that's similar to nicotine. But the bottom line is that's why Senator Franson put this forward bill, and this is why I signed on. We need to have the discussion. This isn't about trying to get a bill passed this session. This is about trying to move that discussion forward. When two political groups become major political parties based on this one issue, when we have medical marijuana eligible diagnoses expanding left and right to include very broad encompassing uh, considerations, it, it's time to have the discussion. But in terms of impaired safety on the roads, it's a huge issue to me. And I would advocate that we do indeed set two things, both field sobriety tests as well as an arbitrary level. One of the things we have an obligation to do is I think we need that to let people learn what their level will be. If they do eat a gummy bear or have half a brownie, four hours later, what's their level? Eight hours later, what's their level? We need to help them, and we can do that too. Uh, Senator France and I have talked about that specifically. So I really think that that's where we're going. We're trying to say, you know, we're not going to turn a deaf ear to this, and we're not going to play politics on this, issue, on this issue. We're going to discuss it. And do we have all the answers? No. But in the process, we're all going to get smarter, and I'll tell you, I'm sure that after the coverage this morning, Minnesotans will engage all the more. So again, thank you for bringing your interest level to this issue. And just one thing I wanted to mention on the topic of impairment, too. We did think that was an important issue to address and to dedicate some resources to. So at this point, we don't um, dedicate most, a, a majority of the, some of the funding goes to uh, goes to equity equ equity considerations in areas that have been hit hard by the war on drugs but then after that we don't most a majority of the funds that this would generate go toward go just go towards the general fund we didn't think it was appropriate at this stage to dedicate it to education or transportation or anything like that but there are some dedications in there to issues that this specifically raises um, one is uh, public health research into the impacts of cannabis but one 10 percent of the remaining funds are appropriated just reading it here, to the Commissioner of Public Safety to train peace officers on how to recognize cannabis impairment. Um, so we want to make sure there's resources available for that because that is an area we're learning more and more about every day. On the expungement piece, would, would the individual offenders have to apply or would you have law enforcement or the courts review <coughs> all these cases and just kind of do a blanket expungement? Or? There's a few approaches to that. For the expungement, um, if, uh, we'll be engaging with uh, our um, attorney general's office and making sure that, uh, that people already qualify for them. They work with the prosecutors at the local level, that they get the um, notice that they are eligible for expungement. And if people are, are still are not necessarily eligible, there will be a process that they can um, apply to be eligible and, and to reconsider uh, those type of uh, cases on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. But it, it would be any, um, under this bill, um, starting in uh, 2019, uh, anything August 1st, 2019, um, anything before that would be expunged. I know that everybody's mentioned how controversial this is and how certainly there are people in your caucus, Senator, um, probably in both caucuses that are opposed to it, but going back to the Carver County meeting and having 90% of people in Carver County at a town hall meeting with 150 people there, that strikes me as pretty extraordinary. And if that's the case in other conservative counties, I'm sure these other legislators are going to be hearing from those folks. I mean, it sounds like... Well, my, my, my actual town hall is tomorrow, so I'm sure um, if it's not too cold, people will show up. But even in my district, which is a very centrist, middle of the road swing district, I've been hearing for both sides, people who are concerned about uh, the public health. Um, I've been called names already. Um, I won't repeat them here because they're not... Um, um, proper, but uh, it's right about, it's, we're policymakers. We need to tackle policy, and this is a policy issue of our time in Minnesota where we need to tackle it. We can't just ignore it. It's not going to be solved on its own. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm willing to hear from both sides, and if it's not going to happen, um, I'm not the only one that needs to vote for this. It's a, a complete um, senator, um, legislature, and House and Senate issue, and the governor. So if it's not ripe, uh, then we'll take more time to discuss. 
I was just going to say that this morning, the last thing I asked my wife before we, I left was, Mary, do you remember when I asked for a show of hands on Saturday morning at the town hall meeting? And she said, yeah. And I said, what was your impression? She said, well, there are only four or five hands that didn't go up out of more than 100 people there. So I said it was definitely more than 90 percent because they raised their hands and we had both A's and nays show their hands. So I was, I was surprised. I, I really was because we had a lot of conservative folks there, a fair amount of liberals and a fair amount of, if you will, independent moderates. But they were clear it's time to have the discussion. So I frankly feel a debt of gratitude to Representative Freiberg as well as uh, Senator Franzen for not ducking the issue. And, and I also want to mention that uh, our co-author as well in the Senate is Senator Ann Rest, who is from Golden Valley, and she is our lead in the tax committee, so um, purposely um, looking for someone who can give us insight of what that framework would look like, uh, because it, uh, but it's not, again, the main focus of this bill is to focus on the regulatory framework and then um, talk about taxation, but um, her interest is also, I don't want to speak on her behalf, but certainly I, I, I want her guidance um, in this conversation on the taxation piece. What are, what are the first stops in the House and Senate for this bill? Do you, do you know that at this point? Or? Uh, I would assume in the House it will get referred to the Health Policy Committee. Um, there was a constitutional amendment bill that was introduced last week by Representative Ray Dean of, of Minneapolis, who's also a co-author on this bill. Um, and that went to the Health Policy Committee. I'm assuming most of the cannabis bills will go there in the House, and I can't speak for the Senate. For the Senate, I, I, I don't know. if um, I think we'll ask at least for an informational hearing, and hopefully we'll get that. So I'll work with my colleagues um, and see where we go. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for being here. Have a good day.